Welcome. This is the one year Bible reading for January 27th, and we left Moses speaking with the Lord at the burning bush. So we are starting at the beginning of chapter four of Exodus. But Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw, it down, threw down the staff and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Perform this sign, the Lord told him. Then they will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, really has appeared to you. Then the Lord said to Moses, now put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out again, his hand was white as snow with a severe skin disease. Now put your hand back into your cloak, the Lord said. So Moses put his hand back in, and when he took it out again, it was as healthy as the rest of his body. The Lord said to Moses, if they do not believe you and are not convinced by the first miraculous sign, they will be convinced by the second sign. And if they don't believe you or listen to you, even after these two signs, then take some water from the Nile River and pour it onto the dry ground. When you do, the water from the Nile will turn to blood on the ground. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, O oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Then the Lord asked Moses, Who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. But Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else. Then the Lord became very angry with Moses. All right, he said, what about your brother, Aaron the Levite? I know he speaks well, and look, he is on your way, his way to meet you now. He will be delighted to see you. Talk to him and put the words in his mouth. I will be with both of you as you speak, and I will instruct you both in what to do. Aaron will be your spokesman to the people. He will be your mouthpiece, and you will stand in the place of God for him, telling him what to say. And take your shepherd's staff with you and use it to perform the miraculous signs I have shown you. So Moses went back home to Jethro, his father-in-law. Please let me return to my relatives in Egypt, Moses said. I don't even know if they are still alive. Go in peace, Jethro replied. Before Moses left Midian, the Lord said to him, Return to Egypt, for all who wanted to kill you have died. So Moses took his wife, his sons, and put them on a donkey and headed back to the land of Egypt. In his hand, he carried the staff of God. And the Lord told Moses, When you arrive back in Egypt, go to Pharaoh and perform all the miracles I have empowered you to do. But I will harden his heart so he will refuse to let the people go. Then you will tell him, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. I commanded you, let my son go so he can worship me. But since you have refused, I will now kill your firstborn son. On the way to Egypt, at a place where Moses and his family had stopped for the night, the Lord confronted him and was about to kill him. This is a hard thing to understand because the Lord has sent Moses on a mission. Why is he trying to kill him? Well, the people of God were to be set apart by circumcision, and because Moses uh, grew up in Egypt, he was never circumcised, nor were, was his family. And so this is really uh, cutting himself off from the people of God to not be circumcised. <clears throat> really shows the holiness of the Lord. But Moses' wife, Zipporah, took a flint knife and circumcised her son. She touched his feet with the foreskin and said, Now you are a bridegroom of blood to me. When she said a bridegroom of blood, she was referring to the circumcision. After that, the Lord left him alone. Now, I just misspoke, I realize, because Moses must have been circumcised, but his children were not. Feel free to correct me in the comments. 
Now, the Lord had said to Aaron, go out into the wilderness to meet Moses. So Aaron went and met Moses at the mountain of God, and he embraced him. Moses then told Aaron everything the Lord had commanded him to say. And he told him about the miraculous signs the Lord had commanded him to perform. Then Moses and Aaron returned to Egypt and called all the elders of Israel together. Aaron told them everything the Lord had told Moses. And Moses performed the miraculous signs as they watched. Then the people of Israel were convinced that the Lord had sent Moses and Aaron. When they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. After this presentation to Israel's leaders, Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh. They told him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. Is that so? retorted Pharaoh. And who is the Lord? Why should I listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, but I will not let Israel go. But Aaron and Moses persisted. The God of the Hebrews has met with us, they declared. So let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness so we can offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. If we don't, he will kill us with a plague or with the sword. Pharaoh replied, Moses and Aaron, why are you distracting the people from their tasks? Get back to work. Look, there are many of your people in the land, and you are stopping them from their work. That same day, Pharaoh sent his order to the Egyptian slave drivers and the Israelite foremen. Do not supply any more straw for making bricks. Make the people get it themselves, but still require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That's why they are crying out, let us go and offer sacrifices to our God. Load them down with more work. Make them sweat. That will teach them to listen to lies. So the slave drivers and foremen went out and told the people, this is what Pharaoh says. I will not provide any more straw for you. Go and get it yourselves. Find it wherever you can, but you must produce just as many bricks as before. So the people scattered throughout the land of Egypt in search of stubble to use as straw. Meanwhile, the Egyptian slave drivers continued to push hard. Meet your daily quota of bricks, just as you did when we provided you with straw, they demanded. Then they whipped the Israelite foreman they had put in charge of the work crews. Why haven't you met your quotas either today or yesterday, they demanded. So the Israelite foreman went to Pharaoh and pleaded with him. Please don't treat your servants like this, they begged. We are given no straw, but the slave drivers still demand make bricks. We are being beaten, but it isn't our fault. Your own people are to blame. But Pharaoh shouted, you're just lazy, lazy. That's why you're saying, let us go and offer sacrifices to the Lord. Now get back to work. No straw will be given to you, but you must still produce the full quota of bricks. The Israelite foreman could see that they were in serious trouble when they were told, you must not reduce the number of bricks you make each day. As they left Pharaoh's court, they confronted Moses and Aaron, who are waiting outside for them. The foreman said to them, may the Lord judge and punish you for making us stink before Pharaoh and his officials. You have put a sword into their hands, an excuse to kill us. It isn't always easy to be the Lord's spokesman, as uh, Moses and Aaron are finding out here. Matthew 18, starting in chapter 1. About that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who becomes a little child like this, on my behalf, is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. What sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin? Temptations are inevitable, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? So if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire with both of your hands and feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. 
Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the ninety-nine others on the hills and go out and search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the ninety-nine that didn't wander away. In the same way is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. It is not (laughs) that even one of these should perish. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again, so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. Psalm 22, finishing this psalm today, starting in verse 19. Such a messianic psalm that we read yesterday already. O Lord, do not stay far away. You are my strength. Come quickly to my aid. Save me from the sword. Spare my precious life from these dogs. Snatch me from the lion's jaws and from the horns of these wild oxen. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. Praise the Lord, all you who fear him. Honor him, all you descendants of Jacob. Show him reverence, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. He has not turned his back on them, but has listened to their cries for help. I will praise you in the great assembly. I will fulfill my vows in the presence of those who worship you. The poor will eat and be satisfied. All who seek the Lord will praise him. Their their hearts will rejoice with everlasting joy. The whole earth will acknowledge the Lord and return to him. All the families of the nations will bow down before him, for royal power belongs to the Lord. He rules all the nations. Let the rich of the earth feast and worship. Bow before him all who are mortal, all whose lives will end in dust. Our children will also serve him. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. They will hear about everything he has done. Proverbs 5, 15 through 21. Drink water from your own well. Share your love only with your wife. Why spill the water of your springs in the streets, having sex with just anyone? You should reserve it for yourselves. Never share it with strangers. Let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. She is a loving deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you always. May you always be captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, by an immoral woman or fondle the breasts of a promiscuous woman? For the Lord sees clearly what a man does, examining every path he takes. And to end, we are back in our Psalm of Work, Psalm 127 and this called pointless. If God is not central to our everyday work, then what we are doing is meaningless. What is the point of making money or achieving anything unless God is in it? As believers, we are obliged to take God at his word and to recognize that he and he alone is the only reality. How can we possibly exclude the creator from our work? Three times in the space of two verses, the words in vain are repeated. The psalmist does this to emphasize that God and his children are involved together in everything, and none of us dare dispense with our senior partner. Many of God's children, some of whom may be reading these lines today, spend long working hours and sleepless nights struggling to be successful in business and fail because they never have seen the necessity of consulting their senior partner about every matter. 
I have known many believers who have embarked on a business project without reference to the Lord, and only when things have gone wrong have they tried to bring God into it. Then they have become frantic and started taking measures such as tithing their profits in the hope that he will rescue them from distress. No Christian ought to embark on any venture or business project without first consulting the Lord. And if you are sure God is not in your work or business, then you should not be involved in it. It's pointless to expend your energy on matters in which God is not involved. Hear the words again, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Oh God, help us to evaluate our work carefully in the light of what we have read today. We do not want our work to be pointless. We want it to be meaningful, fulfilling your purposes. Help us, my Father, in Jesus' name, amen. So I pray the Lord's blessing today on whatever your hand finds to do. <laughs> Love you all. Have a wonderful day.